Your style is unorthodox. But effective. It is not the art, but the combat that you enjoy. Man, you come right out of a comic book. You are now, now listening, listening to Black, Black Comics, Comics Chat. Chat. Black, Black, Black Comics Chat. We are live on Black Comics Chat. Black Comics Chat. Black Comics Chat. We are live on Black Comics Chat. What's up, everybody? This is Marcus Kwame, and you are listening to Black Comics Chat Podcast. Um, Black Comics Chat was started in 2014 by author Thelonious Legend, and it grew into a podcast in January of 2015. At this point, we've recorded about six or seven episodes. Um, You may be hearing them a little bit out of order, but we'll be getting them all online eventually. So I'm just going to skip any further introduction. Let's just get into this episode. Um, This was a very special one. It was recorded during Women's History Month. Grace led a discussion along with her panel of four very talented ladies. And uh, without any further ado, here it is. get this party started so welcome welcome today is friday march 27th and um we are live on black comics chat today you will notice it's a little bit different today um it's all it's all the i got my my ladies with me today hey hey so, um in honor and solidarity of um women's history month i figure why not Go with the flow and, you know, let's see what the women have to say and what they want to talk about. And we just kind of can go from there. And so uh, first up on uh, the docket, and we have here Fuma Richardson. You know, I'm going to give a hand clap there. Yay. 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 special. And, <laughs> yes, everybody is special. Let's, let's make sure we put that out there. <laughs> okay. okay. And so... Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so with a uh, fool is I'm I'm Lord have mercy, I you know, I'm gonna go off the cuff here. So a fool is an acclaimed artist. She is uh has the uh, comic out named Genius that you must get and must read. It is like a you know, it's a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. You also need to check out her work on um the new Captain America. What you know, I, I'm gonna say this is is genius and another genius. Um and <laughs> She's also a musician. Got to put that out there as well. So she, as she likes to call herself, a, a jack of trades or J, or Jane of trades, rather. Jane of trades. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, also uh, a good friend of mine, and you know, just you know, someone who truly is on her game, and um, someone who I've looked up to since I've been looking at comics. So I definitely want to give a huge shout out and a huge thank you, a fool, for joining us today on the chat. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. And so next up, we have Jamie Bronex, who is the founder and creator of the online community Black Girl Nerves, which I must say, yes, I'm a, proud, a part of and so proud to be a part of. Uh, BGN is a website, podcast, and social media playground that invites online users to engage in live tweets, online chats, and fun hashtags. Uh, Jamie has been featured, and Black Girl Nurse has been featured in Marie Claire Magazine as one of Shonda Rhimes' kudos, favorites to follow on Twitter, and she was listed on the, the Griot's Top 100 list of influential people of color. Yes! And Jamie has appeared on panels at Geek Girl Con and Princeton most recently to discuss how blurred culture is impacting new media. So let's give a hand clap for Jamie Bronis. Yes! Thank you. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> Next up on the list, we have uh, Deborah Whaley, who is... Um, as she likes to go by artist, writer, and professor of American Studies at the University of Iowa. You can catch her soon in this late summer, early fall with her um, book that she just finished on black women in comics. I definitely will be ordering that. Uh, Go ahead and put me down um, with that. And uh, like I said, it will be published and will be out in late summer, early fall. So let's give uh, Deborah Whaley a hand clap as well. Yes, yes. And so we got one more up on the list here. 
Nara Walker, who is joining us today, and uh, I want to give a special kudos to her for uh, coming in on, on the chat. Um, I uh, definitely want to also kudos to Deborah for uh, recommending her to join us today. So she is also an artist as well and uh, likes to put out dreams into drawings. And if you've ever checked out her Instagram page, which is um, at Pretty ISM, you will see that the, her dreams really do come into her drawings. So uh, let us welcome Nara Walker to the panel as well. Hello. Yay. Alrighty, ladies. So before we dig in, so it is Black Comics ch Chat, and um, we are, you know, going to be talking about the comics and talking about some hot topics as well. But my first thing that I want to ask each and every one of you was like, what brought you to comics? You know, since that's what we're talking about, what was it that said uh, led you to this, or in, in some way or some sort of fashion? And everybody can. It, it doesn't matter who starts. <laughs> Um, well, I'll start. Uh, this is Jamie from Black Girl Nerds. I started in comics when I was around 10 years old, and um, uh, it, it really first started from just seeing a lot of the kids in my neighborhood trading comics and trading comic cards, and I was interested in that. Um, and then, two years into it, in 92, the X-Men animated series came out. And I really loved seeing the various characters, and one intrigued me the most, which was Storm. And I just wanted to check that out. And I also really loved Gambit, and um, they had an X-Men Adventure series that was based off of the animated series that I also collected the comic books for. So, yeah, television and uh, collecting trades as a kid and cards, that's what got me into comic books. All righty. Uh, I'll go next. Cool. Um, this is Fua Richardson. Here in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> I, um, I have also been a big fan of comics since around the age of 9 or 10. And uh, I was a serious tomboy. Um, my friends would actually forget that I was a gal. <laughs> <laughs> so they would, you know, swap comics for candy and all sorts of things and I started getting into the X-Men and Alan Moore Swamp thing even though I had no idea what was going on. Um, I was a really big X-Factor fan. I too love Gambit but I also love Nightcrawler because I really love the idea of being able to teleport anywhere and um, yes yeah, I, I never stopped. Uh, in high school I got into anime and and manga, and it just kept growing from then on out. And I um, I gained the chutzpah <laughs> to get into comics uh, uh, a little later in life. But, cool. Yeah. So I guess I can go next. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah. So uh, this is Deborah. Um, I, I don't think I can pinpoint a certain age when I necessarily got into comics. Um, just pretty much ever since I can remember, like really, really young. Um, I was born in 1969, so I'm a child of the 1970s, and the 1970s was a really interesting time for representations, right, I see a food doing the little dance, <laughs> um, um, representations of women, right, so this is a moment where we have television shows like um, Wonder Woman coming on, um, Eartha Kitt's rendition of Catwoman came in the late 1960s, but of course it was on reruns in the 1970s, and I just remember sort of watching Batman and seeing Eartha Kitt as Catwoman woman and um, watching Linda Carter as Wonder Woman and you know having a Wonder Woman bathing suit and like running around the house with like a fake cape which was a towel and my Wonder Woman bathing suit singing the nice. Wonder Woman theme song and um, just loving the representations of women as sort of powerful figures through um, comic book uh, characters so it was both through television um, and then reading comic books and I've also um, been drawing since I can remember and the only sort of formal training I've ever had in drawing or art is through cartooning and taking courses in cartooning and classes in cartooning and so it just really snowballed from there you know just in terms of drawing and television and popular culture 
and then um, you know later ended up uh, writing a book about the topic. So um, I'll leave it there, and I guess we can talk more about our childhood memories of <laughs> comics <laughs> and how that affected us, uh, etc. Cool. Am I the only one left? That's it. Yes. <laughs> it's yeah. all you. Oh geez. Uh, well, I was <laughs> so I. According to my parents, I've always been into comics and drawing. I started like I guess Disney had comics back then, and then there's we're in England, so there was like Transformers comics. Oh. He came along and Jam, so it's kind of like comics and then a lot of animation that influenced me. Cool. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. All right. Well, I, I guess I could say also, um, you know, my grandmother got me into comics. She, when really? she used to read the Aww. newspaper, uh, mm -hmm. she used to give me the funny papers and said, all right, here's your, here's your newspaper to read. And um, so I kind of started with comic strips and then kind of eventually went into uh, comics. And for me, um, I guess my first kind of like exposure was Storm because it was like, yes, there's a black woman and somebody that looks like me. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I just assumed there were many more that looked just like me, but I would come to find out, yeah, it's not too many. What happened? What's going on? And so I really wouldn't have that kind of like epiphany until um, like later in high school when I really could understand it. But um, I've always loved comics and even more so now. It's like, especially with the movies and the adaptations, it kind of just makes everything just kind of gel together and, it gives me an opportunity to step outside of my reality. So that's the one great thing I love about comic. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it, it, you know, a relief in some ways, too. And much like a full album, I'm, you know, I was a tomboy and, and to some degree still kind of that today. So. Yeah, I was a tomboy as well. So for sure, for sure. And so, so since we've kind of like put out the background, well, who's some of you have already mentioned some of your favorite characters, but were there any others that we haven't mentioned as far as fave characters um, that you all follow, like whether new or um, or older? Uh, Sailor Moon. Ooh, okay, all right. <laughs> uh, Martha Washington. Yes, yes. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. <laughs> So we got Sailor Moon, Martha Washington, I heard we had Nightcrawler, of course, Storm, uh, Jim, I heard, okay. yep. Gambit. Okay, we got a nice little collection there. <laughs> I, I had a secret obsession with Chitara from the Thundercats. Oh, no, she's yes. not she in the comics. <laughs> she, was, so she, was a little, she was a little stoic and kind of had a little bit of a manly voice, but... Um, I joined the track team when I was in school just because of Chitara. Wow. I the theme song in my head because I was also in bands. I was like, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Da -da 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 -da. like, I was lame. I was actually lame. I would be the first to admit that. <laughs> That's not lame. <laughs> but I loved her. She was always, like, she was a part of the crew. Like, she wasn't somebody to be rescued. You, you know what I mean? Like, she would, uh, it was like, oh, yeah. Lion is in trouble. Somebody get Chitara. Right, right. I love that. I was like, yes, me. So I went on to try and save people at my school. <laughs> a friend of mine from high school actually hit me up and said, hey, are you the Afua Richardson that used to play the flute? I'm like, yeah, that's that's me. What, what did I do? And he said, well, a actually, you saved me. I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, someone had, I, I was living in New York, and uh, a, f a friend of mine at the time had a book bag, and he had it on one shoulder, and someone came and robbed him and grabbed it off of his shoulder, and I had on high heels at the time, so I took off my heels, he said, and ran after them through oh, the wow. subway cars. I had boots on, so I swung my boot overhead and bataranged him in the face. Oh wow! Back his book bag. You should make. I could have been. <laughs> I could have been killed. Yeah. <laughs> but you saved the day. You gotta. Be, you can't beat that. I tried. I tried. It's all comics' fault. <laughs> <laughs> the power of comic books. It is. It is. Now, now, this is something you know. As you all are talking, it makes me think. Um, what do we think as far as do comics? 
are they still are they evolving? Are they um, have they kind of gone backwards? What is it that we can say about comics? You know that it is today in 2015. What can we say about it? Well, comics in general are are like women in comics or black women in comics or just we we can start with you know start with comics and then go with like uh, black women in comics or like as far as like gender in comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's definitely changing. There's so much more out there now. Um, different types of representations that I don't think we saw like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the representations in comics have kind of changed along with the historical times and, and moment, right? Right. So now we have um, hybrid characters, post-human characters, um, characters um, that represent um, different types of sexuality, different types of racial ethnic identities. Uh, and so we didn't necessarily see that. 30 years ago. So I think there's lots of strides that have been made, but you know, at the same time there's still also more of the same that some people see as problematic, like the hypersexualization of women or just the a recapitulation of the same type of tropes and narratives, right, in comics, whether you're talking about superhero comics or whatever the genre of, of comics is, but there's also all this um, sort of innovation and the um, impact that I think um, Japanese comics has had and, and anime and manga I think has, has changed the game a lot. Um, so uh, yeah, those are sort of my thoughts on, yeah. on where we are today and some changes. Definitely. I think also as the demand has increased and the, the old guard of comics has been replaced with uh, newer people and more um, open-minded um, editors and, and people who are in positions of power, they're listening to the fans because people are putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah. Whereas before, it wasn't necessarily, and I can't presume to know the intentions of the creators of these characters, but a lot of... Uh, publishers of books were thinking, oh, well, there are not a lot of people who would like to read a book about a black protagonist, of a female protagonist, a gay protagonist. I th they, they thought, oh, well, they only want to see characters that resemble them, and that's who will buy them. If we make a book with a black protagonist, it'll be assumed that it's only for black people and that those kinds of stories won't sell. But as that misconception is being broken more and more books you're seeing are being created and a lot more independent books are being created now as well as the market opens up especially with something like image comics opening the floor to creators to create the books that they want how they want to the majors in suit have to or I guess I should say the majors have to follow suit and keep up and evolve with the evolution of comics and comic characters as proper representation and more realistic representation of femininity, beauty, and uh, just general archetypes are depicted in fiction. For sure, for sure. So we're seeing those changes and we're seeing people buy those changes and therefore we'll continue to see those changes as the, the market keeps up with the demand. Yeah, I think I saw somewhere that 47% of people that read comics are women. Yeah. Um, that's a big number, and I, I think it's important that comic book creators and uh, the publishing houses like Image Comics and Marvel and DC really pay attention to the fact that there are a large number of us that are reading these com comics, we're creating these comics, and um, our voices need to be represented and heard. I actually um, today just got through reading, um, which is also an image comic, Rocket Girl. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I was just amazed. Like, the protagonist is a 15-year-old girl, and there are scientists that are both women, both women of color. Um, so I, I love seeing that, you know, they're really pushing the envelope and representing women and women of color in all um, forms, whether you're the superhero protagonist 
or whether you know you're a supporting character in the background, but you're like a super science astrophysicist or whatever. Oh. Um, so, so I think it's awesome what what a lot of comics are doing, and I'm really really proud as well as to what IDW is doing with the Gem and the Holograms comic with respect to not only diversity mm. but body diversity. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is so important. Like seeing a plus size Aja and <laughs> and Shayna and seeing them, um, and also uh, the the Misfits Roxy. I think that is awesome because you know I was used to seeing the cookie cutter size, maybe zero uh, Gem and the Holograms from in the '80s, and to see all of this diversity, including both body diversity, I, I think that that's very important. So it's good to see these kind of changes being made. Absolutely. Um, that number, like the percentage, does that include manga, or are they just talking about like American comics? Um, that's mm -hmm. off of American comics. I don't know much about manga, so but that's yeah, what I've read on yeah. American. <laughs> I would think that manga would be a little different because of the medium itself. In Japan, manga is treated as a um, general media format, where, whereas it's just coming to pass that in American culture, comics and graphic novels, which are one and the same, um, is considered an adult medium. Mm -hmm. So manga is to Japan as movies is to America. Mm, okay. So the demographic is much larger, much broader, and covers a larger scope. Mm. Nar, do you have a kind of a, a feel for what the gender demographic is? Because it, it seems to me like there is a really large percentage of women readers of, uh, but I don't have the statistic. I don't even know at all of, of manga. Just from the little bit of research that I've done, do you have a sort of feel for the readership? I don't have numbers. Just from here in the States where I've gone to conventions, there's lots of girls there. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's half the con, but it's a huge number. It's not like, oh, there's a girl here, so they're surprised to see a girl. Right. And, and I know in Japan it's huge as well because I had a Japanese pen pal and it didn't make sense to her that girls can't read comics because there's some weird article online on the West about girls not reading comics, and she's like, that doesn't make sense. And I didn't know how to explain it to her. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't there they do. <laughs> so I was like, I can't explain it. It's just a thing over here. It's coming from manga and reading so many mangas which are created by women, that just didn't like make sense to me at all. And European comics as well. So as I say, lots of women do make comics. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, lots of women do make comics, and I, I don't know what you all think about this question, but it's still oftentimes seen as, like, a, a male arena, right. both in terms of producers and consumers, and I'm, I'm just interested if anyone has any thoughts about that or if, if that's something to talk about at all. Like, why is that perception still at, out there, even though there has been women creating comics um, for you know, decades and, and decades, and women reading comics. So, yeah, I think you know, some it, part of it has to do. You know, we're like in a patriarchal society, so where it's as you mentioned, it's it's male dominated, and so I think as we get more women who get into the positions of power. Um, not just the artists and the you know um, and the the creators and the illustrators you know but like the owners in some sort I think that may also play a role mm -hmm. in um, in kind of changing of the guard so to speak and um, you know even in addition to just acknowledging women more so like like tonight's panel the fact that we have this all panel you know of women discussing you know the diversity and gender and comics you know these are the steps that you know have to be taken and then with books that are talking about gender, more and more of those coming out. And, you know, with even in academic purposes of people discussing it on their thesis and dissertations and, you know, the fact that women are coming to the cons in huge droves. Like, you can't deny that. You can't miss that. It, it's it's so visible. It's it's right there. So I think, I mean, I think we're taking the steps, but um, I definitely think we, you know, kind of have to also get in those this those huge positions of power, too, at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always going to be an outcry from the fanboys, no matter what. Um, yeah. When there's diversity and seeing more women um, being represented as the protagonists in a story, and we all saw what happened when the announcement about Thor um, yeah. coming out as female, um, which in fact it's not Thor that's female; it's just a female um, character that is taken over. Um, you know the the. Uh, the, hammer. the hammer, yeah. yeah. So, um, but another thing as well is comic book movies. I think that's a bigger conversation to be had because, uh, you know, comic book characters are becoming celebrities, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of these celebrity superheroes are the ones that are in the forefront of everybody's eyes, and folks that are not even into comics are just into those comic book characters because of what they see on the big screen. So I think that that plays a big role because a lot of those comic book characters are male characters that we see uh, when we go to the theaters. Absolutely. I think also the, um, the accolades... You know, we don't really realize how many women there are in comics. Right. There are a lot. But Mm -hmm. the praise still goes to a lot of male illustrators. And it's not to say that they're not good or not worthy of, you know, celebration. But I think it's assumed that women only draw girly comics or they only draw a particular style and, and therefore they're just not as good. But that's changing. And I, I think as people are starting to take notice and like I said, the old guard is shifting. Like once uh, Joe Quesada, for example, became the uh, editor in chief at Marvel, he released the movie rights. And then the doors flew way open because the only people who had any movie rights to major comic book Um, properties previously were Warner Brothers in association with DC Vertigo with the Batman movies. So they were doing comic book movies by themselves forever. Hmm. And then Joe Quesada came in and said, yeah, you know, we're going to change that. (laughs) And then opened up the floodgates of of X-Men and the Avengers and then Disney invested and that completely changed the game. Mm. But um, so it's 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 evolving. It's slow. <laughs> There's right, right, there. steady, slow and steady. <laughs> slow, slow and steady wins the race. But um, I think as we start to pay attention, because like off the top of your head, can you name ten female artists and writers in comics? I think we could if we we yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're all. Um, I can't, but <laughs> writers it might be a little harder to to name than artists. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, comic book resources put this amazing list together, and uh, I'm actually going to post it here in the chat, and I will post it on Twitter too, so people can familiarize themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting that the different roles that women play, right? So we have the writers, we have the artists, but um, also um, women who have um, been editors at, you know, particular comic book um, companies. So maybe they're not the sole author of the comic, but they're a part of the editing process, the editorial process, yes. and are um, in different uh, positions of uh, production. So, I and mean, I don't know if, if that's something... Um, to, to talk about at all, but one of the things I'm sort of interested in, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about this, is, you know, are there differences between women as writers and producers and artists vis-a-vis men in terms of, like, um, you know, progressive representations of women, right? Because, um, I mean, we were talking about Martha Washington earlier. Mm-hmm. I can think of even really early comic strips in the 1970s, like Friday Foster, um, for all of the, the problems with the comic strip. It was really sort of innovative in a lot of ways, too, to portray this sort of um, single black woman um, in a way in which we hadn't seen in popular culture. So I don't know if that's something to sort of take up, just the differences between... Um, women as producers and writers and artists or, or men, you know, are there differences? Is it really just about writing a good story and being a good illustrator and being attuned to different types of portrayals or, um, you know, does, does gender matter? 
Hmm. 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 <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. More of just a kind of, you know, co comment. I don't know. I don't see a difference with what women create as opposed to men. I think women are more sensitive to inclusion right. and diversity. So, you know, marginalized voices are inclusive of other marginalized voices. So in that aspect, yes, that's what makes us different from, from the guys. But as far as the narrative, I, I don't see you know, much of a difference in how we create content over what we see today with a lot of these male-centric stories. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you mentioned Martha Washington, who, by the way, is like one of my all-time fave characters. Um, you know, like Frank Miller, you know, uh, Pope Pre going crazy and nuts, you know, created... <laughs> This you, old, you know, you know, <laughs> like Martha Washington is one of those characters. I'm still trying to figure out like this one. She's like ideal as far as, you know, she's human. She's, you know, she's got the flaws, but at the same time, she's, you know, she holds a leadership role. She's able to like go into the future. She's able to do a lot of things that not a, um, many um, uh, women characters, at least within like some of the big two of DC and, and Marvel, um, have been able to, you know, to be portrayed in such a way. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I sit and, and really try to figure out, and I, I would love to, like, ask him, like, what inspired you to create this character? Because um, she's, like, this round-the-way woman, round-the-way girl who comes out of Cabrini Green but is able to, uh, you know, blast into the future and kind of, like, save the day, so to speak, and, and still bring it. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just something about that 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 character in particular that um, I'm like always blown and amazed by. They need to make that into a movie. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I, they were. I don't know. It could just be a rumor. I don't know if anyone else has, has heard that or if it's just one of those things where people talk about it, but it never happens. I had heard some terrible casting rumor, yes. and I don't know if it's true, but someone threw out Rosario Dawson. That's who I heard, too. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to cry when I heard that. <laughs> yes. Rose is great, but I don't know. Not not for that. Yeah. Lupita! Lupita Nyong'o! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Martha needs some meat on her bones. Are there any MMA fighters? <laughs> yeah. That can act? I mean, because, you know, we can go on, and like, it, particularly, you know, I was, and still to this day, not happy with the casting of Storm with Halle Berry. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's just, you know, but I, you know, I, I know why. I mean, she was the it girl. She was the Hollywood pick, you know, so it was like, yes, this is who we, we put on there, but, you know, if we're going to really, like, be correct as far as Physically and phenotypically and all of that, like she was, it was off, just way mm -hmm. off. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know Storm from the '90s cartoon, but it didn't seem to match up. Hallie as her. Yeah. I I Angela Bassett would have been better, someone like that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, she was offered the role, but uh, declined it. So that's why Angela wasn't in the film. Interesting. Yeah. Everybody throws out Angela's name, but Angela didn't want the role, so could have been. <laughs> Possibly, um, what is her name from uh, True Blood? Uh, Rutina Rutina Wesley. Wesley. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or even Candace McClure. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many. There's so many great actors. Or the uh, the sister from Sleepy Hollow, uh, Nicole Bahari, I think you know could have you know could potentially even be in that role, or even she could maybe do Martha Washington, maybe. She can do anything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'm a fan I agree. <laughs> Storm is one of those really difficult characters to cast because she almost has no personality. Yeah. When you think about all the other X Men, you can think about. Where they, where they're from, what they would say. Like we would all, we can all imagine what uh, Wolverine would say in a bar. Mm -hmm. But Storm, because she has to represent all black women, um, unfortunately, in that particular universe, she almost represents no black women. Mm -hmm. At the same time, she's stoic. She's regal. She's beautiful. She's powerful. 
but we don't really know very much about it. Ooh. Well, I think Greg Pak is changing that. I mean, he's doing a, a fantastic job with the, the Storm series that's out now. Oh, yeah. So uh, I love the fact that we're getting a lot of, a little, well, a little bit here and there, I should say, a little bit of her origin story, a little bit of what she's doing now as headmistress, a little bit with her adventures in, you know, various forms, with the recent one with her and Gambit getting into it, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, so, and then seeing a little bit of what happened with her romance with, you know, Wolverine, and so I, I think that it's, I think it's Sorry. good to, <laughs> yeah, sookie sookie now. Uh, it's, it's good to be able to see all of these different aspects of Storm that we haven't been able to see through the, uh, you know, through the team series. And it makes sense because this is the first time she's had her own series. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So people are able to elaborate on her personality. Mm -hmm. makes sense. Yep, totally. And hopefully, you know, with that, there'll be more of, you know, those who will be will be able to get their, their origin stories and be able to, you know, have series that are, like, dedicated to them. So, I mean, I think it starts with one, and it's like a domino effect. So uh, I, don't, I don't think this is the, the beginning and the end. I think this is just, you know, the the uh, kind of, like, popping of the cork, so to speak. So. Yes. Yes. But yeah, so and I just noticed I was looking on the Twitter. I, I see we have a uh, Naomi Harris for uh, from uh, Game of Thorns. Uh, uh, Jeff uh, Thorne recommended that for Martha Washington. That's a, another. Uh, That's a good I choice. Yeah, another good choice. Yeah. So, but yes. Yeah, so, um, and I, you know, for all the artists that are on the the panel, so what is it? What do you all think about when creating your characters? What is it that what are the things that come to mind when it comes to the, the characters that you want to um, bring to bring to light, so to speak? Hmm. Um, they got to be interesting enough to carry the story. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. <laughs> I've had that happen. Where they I gotta care. Fell flat, so I had to rework things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they got to... You know, you have to care about them, but they can't be perfect because then you're like, ugh. <laughs> right. They have, right. They have to evolve. Right. They have to grow. And what are, what are some, like, I guess, would, would some say maybe it's like a trial and error type thing or you just kind of go with it and, and run with it? I think within storytelling, you, you establish your characters, you establish the situation, and then you have to kind of create that point of no return. Mm -hmm. Where once they cross this line, you know, they can't go back to the way things were. Gotcha. And creating a character where the audience cares enough about what happens to them is really the challenge. Mm -hmm. So you want to make this person as uh, relatable as possible to create a mirror. And I think that's sort of what's been the problem with previous characters. They, they either have a, a, a personality that doesn't connect with people or something about them is just not very realistic and now I'm not saying that of all female characters or all of all characters previously but you're starting to see the changes um, I was on a panel with Gail Simone and she brought up a very excellent point that a lot of costumes don't match the personality mm -hmm. of the characters you know she said but when she's writing Red Sonia she realizes that Sonia's not modest. <laughs> she's not. She's not modest. She's she just she knows that she's wearing a metal bikini. She mm -hmm. doesn't care. <laughs> you know, but to have characters that don't uh, what they wear is not reflective of them or things like that. It, it's important considering that you are creating a person, so act as if you are just writing the memoirs of a pre existing person when moving forward and creating your character so your audience connects with them. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> and if you all could have like your perfect, well, so we already said they can be perfect, so if you could have your ideal character and if that's, if it's something that's in the works then okay, or but if you could just kind of have like your ideal character, um, what would they be? And I won't even give a gender, I'll just say what would the character be? <laughs> In terms of their attributes, or 
Yeah, I mean, like if you could, like if you could create your own comic book character today, who or who would they be, or what would they be, or kind of like what would they entail? Like you had the ability to create, draw, and all of that good stuff. Um, I've always been drawn to telekinesis. Mm. So I, she would likely be, you know, having those powers, moving objects with my mind. Maybe even some telepathy. I'd like to read minds, um, but be able to block out the negative ones, <laughs> negative thoughts. <laughs> You know, I'd like to know what our president is thinking and, like, you know, people in powerful positions. Um, so it, it would be someone of that ilk. Um, and then, you know, just someone who's really skilled and crafty. I think a little bit of Storm's um, skills as a fighter and to be able to be crafty with thievery, I think I would like to have those skills as well. So, yeah, telepathy, telekinesis, and um, craftiness. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think I'd agree with a lot of that, and um, also kind of uh, picking up on something that Nara and Afu was talking about, too, like characters that are complex, so um, but relatable at the same time, that there's different layers to the character. I like the whole idea of um, superheroes and magic and all of that, but I also like the idea of characters where you have sort of like the everyday person mm -hmm. who um, is able to do magical things like without magic, right? So just um, relying upon their their wit or their um, intuition. So, um, yeah, for me, I guess it's just uh, agreeing a lot with... Um, what some of you have already said, just the idea of complex characters, but also ones that you that are not so complex that you can't necessarily relate to them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, like characters that are full of contradictions, um, that are fallible, and I guess that's a lot of what um, Nara was talking about earlier too. So, not like necessarily like these um, perfect sort of completely unobtainable characters. Although there's something really appealing about that too, the kind of magic of the superhero um, at the same time. Hmm. Well, I'm drawn to magical girls because I really liked uh, Sailor Moon because on one hand she was this heroine and powerful, but then she was also kind of clumsy and made bad grades and just wanted to read comic books and play video games all day so I could relate to that a lot. So I guess it would be someone who well, I don't like to use the term the normal girl, but someone who's kind of normal, but then the situation comes upon them, and then they decide to do the right thing once they're put into that situation. Mm -hmm. so people like to think if they're in a situation where they have to kind of fight for justice, they would. Hmm. Or I like to think so. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I definitely like the relatable. And, you know, um, and then I like the, sometimes I do kind of like the perfect because it's that constant something I can strive to, you know, um, you know, I, I, I may, it, it's, it's like the journey to get to that point and however long it gets, but it's just knowing that, you know, maybe I can get to that point, maybe one day. So, um, yeah, definitely, um, I kind of foresee a character too as well. So, Cool. Well, ladies, what do you all think about this idea of um, now that we have um, with Marvel giving their lineup of all their films that are coming out all the way up until like 2017, um, are we excited? Are we, uh, what, what are kind of like our thoughts on, on the lineup with uh, Marvel and their rundown? I actually didn't look at it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not excited. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I'm excited. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I know Avenger, another Avengers is coming out this year. Oh, yeah. I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought I was going to die before I seen um, a Black Panther film. So yes. I am here. I'm a little upset that they pushed the date back. So yes. hopefully... I'll start taking care of myself, exercising a little bit more, drinking more water. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, 
But um, I'm I'm really excited to see what they're going to do with T'Challa on the big screen. That 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 was a big announcement, especially for us here in the Blurred community. So yeah, it's it's going to be good. Marvel, they're doing their thing. They're not going to disappoint. Um, I think the only Marvel movie that may disappoint um, would be X Men Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> But, you know, I, I want to be cautiously optimistic. I, I hate having to poo-poo on a film before it, it has a chance to come out. But, you know, um, so far I'm, I've got some concerns with the casting already. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you brought up the Black Panther. We ha- I mean, I know this is a, a chat about women in comics mostly, and we haven't really even talked about male characters. But when you brought up the Black Panther, I was sort of thinking about maybe women's relationship to male characters, mm. right? Um, both as consumers, but also as producers, too. Like, what are the things you're thinking about when you're creating male characters and what type of male characters appeal to consumers? Um, and so you were talking about the Black Panther, and when I think of, like, um, comic book characters, not so much in comic strips, but, like, comic books and graphic novels, a lot of the main characters that stand out to me are white male characters, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the ones that I love, like Spider-Man, Batman, Iron Man, you know, these kind of iconic mainstream um, type of characters. So, I mean, I don't even know if there's a place for us to talk about that tonight. Um, at all, but just um, where male characters um, kind of fit in in our relationship to to those characters, um, black male characters or not. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that at all. Well, um, in addition to Black Panther, we also have on Netflix Luke Cage. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's happening, you know. I, I want it to happen a little quicker, but uh, the the diversity is slowly unraveling itself in uh, the comic book universe, and I'm happy to see that um, black characters and women characters are finally getting their due as standalone leads um, in a series or in a film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, Captain Marvel, who yes. is now Carol Danvers. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll they'll have a movie released. Uh, I think July 2018. I'm crossing my fingers for Katie Shaka from mm-hmm. uh, Battlestar Galactica. Yep. Crossing of the fingers. We'll see. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. And then there's a Supergirl series that's going to come on CBS uh, soon. So Ooh. yeah, women I mean, characters are getting represented. And Vixen too, right? I don't know. Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about Vixen. Love Vixen. Vixen, an animated series is going right. to premiere with mm. Vixen. So that's going to be exciting to see. I mean, goodness gracious, that's long overdue. She hasn't even had a solo standalone yet. Right. And hopefully that will spawn uh, her own comic. Well, there, there, is a, there is a Vixen standalone comic series. Um, yeah. Put out, yeah. Send me the link now, because I was not aware of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, also, and, okay. and she had um, a first-run graphic novel in the 1970s too. That was like ne- it was made, but it was never published. You can look at it online. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, it was in the, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. But it, what's it? A, but was it just a um, a graphic novel, or was it an ongoing series? So recently, in 2009, they had an ongoing series, um, and then there was a just a standalone graphic novel in the late 1970s, too, that didn't end up getting picked up. Mm. Okay. I knew about the graphic novel. I didn't know about the 2009. Googling! <laughs> <laughs> now, also, I just noticed yesterday, um, I was looking on Shadow and Act, and Viola Davis is set to play um, Amanda Waller, Right. In in a series, oh. Suicide Squad. Yeah, Suicide yep. Squad. Yeah. Yep. yep, that's exciting as well. Definitely. Exciting. So I'm super excited about, it. and I'm super, you know, because in in the interview, uh, I loved Viola's honesty. She was like, I finally get a chance to like kill people and just like you know go <laughs> in. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I'm all for that. Yes. 
Because <laughs> she's like, that's not how she is in, you know, in her, like, you know, real life. So she's like, yes, finally, you know, I can do something in, you know, this, in this, this dark world. I can kind of step on, step into the dark side, so to speak. Step into the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's kind of warming up with her. How to get away with murder. Yeah. It's her little warm up gig while she gets ready for Suicide Squad. Exactly. So, yes, yes. Well, before I go into the hot topics, I just want to check is there any, any other topics of um, in the comics that any of you ladies would like to put out there and maybe hash out? I'm, I'm all for it. Speaking of movies, we'd like to see. Are there any characters that don't have movies or any comic books that don't have movies that you'd love to see? Because I would love to see Concrete Park. Yes. Big shout out to Absolutely. Eric Alexander and Tony Perrier. I want that movie now. <laughs> volume 2 of Concrete Park comes out next month, so stay tuned for that, folks. Definitely um, should be on your reading list, Concrete Park. Yeah, I, I would love to see Bitch Planet into a movie as well. Yes. And yes. when it's done, if it ever becomes a movie, it's got to be filmed Grindhouse style. Yes. It's got to be filmed that way. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that comic is amazing. The story is amazing. The artwork is excellent. I have nothing but good things to say about it. So that's something I would definitely like to see on film or on, on Netflix as a series. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think also um, we don't have to necessarily wait for it to come to, like, the Hollywood screen. Um, That's true. And, we, you know, Netflix, Hulu, all of those. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just as psyched about, you know, watching it from that avenue versus having to wait, you know, for it to hit the theater. So and sometimes that may be the, the better avenue to take. Yep. And I, I'd like to mention I'm really excited to see uh, Maya Glick's Rain film. It's a fan film about oh, Storm. That's right. So I'm, you know, I I, I, I love the fact that she is taking it upon herself to just go ahead and get a film done about Storm the way she wanted to see Storm represented um, on celluloid. So kudos to Maya Glick um, for the fan film Storm. I don't know when it's coming out, but when rain drops, I'm on it. Sure, for sure. And and then for those who are into the you know the the African diaspora, there is a um, I believe it is um, it's finished and complete. Um, there's this film called The Orishas, uh, and looking at the superheroes um, and like in the likened of Orishas, and uh, it was a British uh, I believe a British um, director who put it together. And so um, that's definitely you know taking the independent side and not relying per se on the big two. To also tell uh, these these stories of um, kind of like these superheroes, so to speak. Absolutely, we can't wait. It, it's sort of like expecting someone else to tell a, an accurate depiction of your thoughts, your experiences, and your life. It, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then getting upset when they get it wrong. Yeah. We have to make our own. We absolutely have to if we want it told. That's really the only way that it's going to happen. Right. And I it's not know. faulting anyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just like, oh, it's kind of like a recipe. You can't make my grandma's macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care, Boston Market. You're not making it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. I really like that as a, as a description, as an allegory there. That's good. Yeah. One interesting, I don't, I don't know if you guys are looking at the, the Twitter feed, too, because it, it's, it's hard to, like, talk and engage and, and look at the questions coming from Twitter at the same time, but one question I see that's sort of interesting is someone was wanting us to talk about representations of um, body image, and mm -hmm. do you think we'll ever get, a, a well, their words, a fat person of color character without them being treated as, like, the comic relief? or the kind of sexless um, best friend type of character. So I guess just mm. issues of like weight and, and, and body image and representations of, of characters. Um, I think we're seeing that already. I mean, the, I think she's only three issues in right now, but we're seeing that with Kelly Sue DeConnick's Bitch Planet. Mm -hmm. She's a great character, Penny Roll, who, um, you know, is, you know, obese. And she is not a trope. 
uh, there's a great, I don't want to spoil it, but there's just this great moment in the comic where she's forced to see herself in a mirror, and she sees herself as beautiful as opposed to seeing herself the way society sees her. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think that that's a really touching part of, of the comic, and I, I really hope to see more of Penny's character in Bitch Planet, and um, that that's just the one that comes to mind. I mean, also, I mentioned it earlier with Gem and the Holograms, right. seeing the body diversity that's happening there. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty more, but those two come to mind for me. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up also. Um, I remember doing my thesis, and um, I had my participants create a, a, a black female character. And um, interesting enough, many of them did not give them the, you know, what the, I guess the, I don't want to say normal, but what you've typically seen in, as far as in women characters and this, you know, svelte figure, you know, a certain size of, you know, breasts and so forth. Like, they gave them what we would see regular on the day on the streets, you know. And so um, I appreciated their honesty in that. Um, I had no idea what they would kind of, like, take with that. But um, being able to just be kind of, like, raw and honest, uh, I think more people are doing that. And um, it's just a matter of us just kind of, like, acknowledging it, Um you know, DC and Marvel, yes, they're there, but there's so many other, like, independent artists who I think are actually revealing, as, you know, and Jamie and many of you all have mentioned, um, a lot of these characters that we see that are kind of, like, disrupting the, the norm, so to speak. So. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, uh, on Twitter, real quick, shout out to a man called Hawk who says he wouldn't mind to see Genius as a TV series. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Shout out to Afua. Yeah, Genius. Love to see Genius as a TV series. Could you, now, uh, Afua, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with, you know, um, drawing for Genius? It was a pretty transformative time. Um, I think I became an activist in working on the series. Okay. It was it was kind of unusual because you know we all know that the system's corrupt. Right. We know. We know. We we know politicians are going to do a sing and, a song and dance. We know that you know police cover up for other cops. We get it. But learning the details as to how and getting the examples thereof, it it really makes you take a step back. And then it start, you start to see the picture as to what's really happening in our country. In, on our planet, just with these ruling class, there is a ruling class, and it is real, and they will have us fighting against each other. And so with Drawing Genius, I started doing research because, you know, I'm from New York, you know, I, I grew up in the streets, <laughs> so I understood to a degree, but I just didn't understand why she was so angry. Mm. I mean, I was just happy to be alive, so, <laughs> uh, but the constant anger, I didn't quite understand. And then I started like paying attention and really reading into the systems, and then reading the uh, the de reading about the detectives who came forward and said, yes, there are members of the CIA who are selling drugs in undesirable neighborhoods, uh, and using those arrest as um, you know they they get incentives. So it's a private prison; they get money from the state as per each prisoner. You, you get it. It's, it's a it's like a two-man con game. So they create the problem, offer the solution, and get paid from both ends. But um, with creating Genius, you know, I started off, and it was a couple of years ago when I when I actually first received the script, and a whole bunch of terrible things happened to me. <laughs> my um, my computer broke because my neighbors upstairs, like they had their dog in the tub and it overflowed in water, dog water poured down into my computer. Um, my relationship went super sour and the guy I was with started going bonkers and found out he was a closet alcoholic. And then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia and um, find out about these architects and engineers who have evidence that you know the World Trade Center was a controlled demolition. And I was just like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, so it was all these like one two punches and it was like, all right, well I gotta do something. I I have to do something. I have all this information. You know, I'm here in in Atlanta, Georgia where the red dog squad was, you know, falsifying evidence and busting into people's places and planting weed on old ladies. 
like, what am I going to do? What, are, what about me as an individual? And I'm trying to draw this comic. I'm <laughs> putting myself in the hospital. Like, it was just yeah. a crazy time. But you know what? It came out exactly at the right time because when I finally finished it and uh, it was published, it was three days before the events of Ferguson. Mm-hmm. Three days. So, it, so those who are unfamiliar with the story, it's about a 17-year-old uh, tactical genius who was born in South Central, whose parents were killed by the police, and she's put into uh, a foster system, which has incentives to break up families, uh, which therefore makes the state your family. Now, she kind of sits back for a moment and says, okay, well, they have us warring against each other. And it, it was kind of amazing, like, while I was working on it, you know, I got contacted by gang members who were just like, you know, thank you for telling me, oh, thank you for telling our story. Wow. Because nobody writes about us. You know, nobody writes about what it's like. And you get trapped in it, like, people look down on us for being in gangs, but when you're eight and you're confronted by a 25-year-old, and it's like, what gang are you a part of? You're not a part of any gang? Well, you're a part of mine now, or you can die. It's that real for people, and understanding that that is something that's systemic, something that has been, you know, put in place, and, you know, self-perpetuated, and, you know, influenced from the outside, you know, that's, it's something that needs to be addressed and spoken about, so it wasn't meant to praise necessarily her forming this militia because she essentially became just like the militarized goons that were uh, enslaving them. Mm -hmm. So she had to have this experience to understand, no, people are not pawns to be uh, disposed of. You know, this is not a game. This is real. This is real life. And every life matters. So, um, this happening right around the time of Ferguson where people are starting to realize, because I've been crying, you know, like, stop police brutality forever now. <laughs> but no, people are just like, oh, Fua, you're just, you're just a conspiracy theorist. It's like, it's just, there are just a few bad apples out there. And it's like, well, are bad apples bad apples if the good apples cover up for the mm -hmm. bad ones? Uh, <laughs> you know, like, so just really having these conversations, really talking about the system, really having a work of fiction, being able to, uh, having the opportunity to work on a work of fiction, because I didn't write it. Mark Bernard and Adam Freeman wrote it. And I'm grateful that they st stuck with me to have this piece come to life because I think it's important for just we're, just as we're talking about accurate descriptions, you know, body uh, representation, gender, um, sexual preference, like seeing someone be a modern day revolutionary and then make mistakes, um, go up against the systems that we ourselves live in that we ourselves are governed by and are ruled over by, that it's important to start to dissect and see, all right, how are we really going to fix this? And so that's what creating genius has done for me. And I will step off my little soapbox now because I can tap dance on it for a couple hours. <laughs> well, we have a, a Twitter user that, that was saying um, from Mermaid Shells that it sounded like the process was come cathartic for you, um, a fool, as far as creating genius. Would you would you say that maybe that would be the case? Absolutely. It it absolutely was. I I have never cried after finishing any work of art before. Wow. And after I finished the last piece, the last panel, like I just I absolutely cried because I put so much of myself into it. I put so much tears and, and sweat and exasperation and just doubts and it just poured it all into the work and I hoped I'm like please please if there is a great uh, architect of this universe let somebody hear it and understand mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, and so in addition to the process so Deborah you have this this book that's coming out what was that process like for you and kind of like what 
got you to wanting to, you know, create this book? Wow. Okay. Um, that's that's a a long answer, but uh, what I mean, what was the process like? Um, the process was amazing. So um, I'm, I'm working on my third book now, but the the book on black women in, in comics is my second book, and it was really freeing after writing, you know, my first book to write a, a second book and feel like. You know, I, I knew what I was, or I know what I'm doing more so than I did with the first book. And um, it was just a, a really amazing process to be able to write about something that I'm really engaged in and really interested about and to try to toe this line between artist and, and scholar was both challenging but invigorating uh, at the same time. Um, that being said, there were, you know, definitely some roadblocks, um, you know, with, with, with my first book that I wrote on, on black sororities, it was um, mostly kind of doing participant observation, um, interviews, um, lots of other types of research, and I thought the second book on black women in comics would be pretty similar. I, I imagine going to lots of... Um, you know, going to Comic Con and um, interviewing fans and writers and artists, and I did do some of that. But I also found that you know, earlier we were talking about the kind of um, the boys' club or the perception of the boys' club, and it, it, in some ways, I kind of experienced that um, in so far as just like going going to comic book stores and you know still always only being the the only woman that I see you know the only black woman that I see um, feeling as if the comic book world even as a writer was hard to kind of um, penetrate uh, and so um, you know it, it was challenging in that way but I have to say overall the process was pretty um, amazing and um, I'm just really lucky that I was able to, to talk to people like Afua and Nara and a, a bunch of other amazing um, women artists and, and writers and to talk about their work and to engage with them and their ideas. Cool, cool. And Nara, you got to tell us what what's on the on the uh, the agenda for you, and and give us a little insight into potentially the projects that you're working on. Um, let's see. I have yet another magical girl story I'm working on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this little girl, she uh, slightly modeled after Kwanzaa, but not too much, because uh, I'd work. I thought about I'd worked on the story years ago, and then I saw her in some films, and it. Like her personality and her appearance kind of clicked with me, so I finally finished a script for the story, and then start drawing it in April. And it's uh, what she does is she travels into people's dreams and fights off dream monsters to prevent them from entering into like our dimension, where they would cause a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's it's a, she's a younger protagonist, so it's almost um, like a storybook because for whatever reason, a lot of children like my work. So I have to decide to make something that's a little bit more child friendly, as well. I hope we'll have that out in May or June. And and speaking of like kid friendly and child friendly, what what do you all think? Um, is there do you all think there are um en uh, not enough, but um, is there a nice uh, I guess selection? Of um of comics and, and and art for for young girls maybe I guess you could say between like uh, five and thirteen that's out there for them or any recommendation that you may have. I'm a big fan of Princeless. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. that's the first that comes to mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jeremy Whitley's Princeless, and also it's not really a comic, but it's a picture book. Greg Pax got the girl who uh, saved herself. I think that's the title. Okay. Um, that's coming out. He's doing a Kickstarter now. I think it just ended though. Um, but that's you know a book that's geared towards young girls, and there's a lot of diversity in that story as well. So. Um, you guys should check that out. I think he's got some stuff, some updates going on on his Tumblr site about that book. Cool. All right. And you, I, oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was wondering if um, anyone on the panel wanted to talk about the representations of black women or lack thereof in anime or, um, yeah. or manga. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, I can't get in that conversation. <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> really? I, mean, I, I honestly, yeah. I, I, I don't watch a lot of anime, um, but the, the anime that I have seen, I, I don't see a whole lot of black female representation. But there's a great contributor on the Black Girl Nerds website by the name of Latanya Penn, who um, is a huge anime geek, and she has managed to find a lot of content that do feature um, women of color um, in various uh, pieces of anime, so she would probably be able to speak on it better than me, but I, I personally haven't seen a whole lot of it. Uh, two off the top of my head, uh, Utena, and I know the uh, anime Bleach has... Yeah, right. um, yeah well. um, Yoruichi? Yeah, there's uh, her as a... And that might be about it. There's Korra. <laughs> I know there's uh, yeah, there's Co Legend of Korra. Like, that's the only one that comes to mind for me. Are you talking just animation or more like Japanese? Uh, yeah, more like anime. I mean, yeah, and there are some characters that are sort of um, culturally ambiguous, right? So maybe mm. black or not, or their origin story sort of starts out as ambiguously African but then changes. I'm thinking of characters like Nadia. From Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot. Yeah. I, there's a really cute uh, girl in Hunter, Hunter that's on Netflix. I forgot her name already. It's in there. There's a guy from Black Lagoon, uh, Dutch. Okay. And then there's Michiko Tuhachin. Um, I believe the main character is black. Michiko is black. I think so. We have to think hard on it. I know that it's a hard one, right? Yeah, right. Um, I mean, and we're talking about anime, and there's been discussion about whether or not um, Aaron Magruder's The Boondocks is anime or not, right? Because it's, I mean, it's complex. It's something um, that originated with uh, an American creator, um, produced in um, Korea, and then he sort of walked away from the project with the latest season. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about either in his comic strip or his television show, The Boondocks, the representations of um, black women, just any ideas about about that, about the, mm -hmm. the Boondocks. And, uh, you know, he has the, the character um, Jasmine. And then in the comic strip, um, you know, it's mostly male-centered, but then the television series, there are these um, black female characters, but, you know, people argued different things about what they think about those characters as being kind of stereotypical, overly sexualized, simplistic, um, some uh -huh. see more. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about that. Well, yeah, and then the fact that it's, it's interesting because the male characters that are portrayed like in the cartoon are portrayed by a, a black woman. Which, you know, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. So I find that very interesting. You know, like there may not be as much representation of black women, but a black woman is actually the voice. The voice of the two of main characters. characters. Yeah. yeah. Which is amazing. I think that's just so cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's like that with a lot of anime. There are a lot of um, young male characters that are uh, voiced over by women, like Naruto. Um. Art Simpson was voiced by a woman for the longest time, or she's still doing it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Art yeah. Simpson's a woman. Oh, right, right, it sure is, yep. Mm. <laughs> I knew that. Secret lives of ladies. So I, I, I guess we're behind <laughs> the scenes. <laughs> Well, I know, Afu is just singing. I mean, I know I've, I've asked Afu of this, and, and we talked about this, like, um, you know, when I did a, a sort of interview with her, and I don't think I've ever asked Nara about this, but the relationship between your work and music, right? So, um, you know, Nara has this amazing book, Songbirds, um, and I know, uh, you know, Afu has said before that music um, also impacts her creative process. I don't know if either of you or if you want to talk a little bit about um, 
the role that music plays in in your creation of 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 comics as artists or writers? Sure. I mean, Nara, if you want to go first. Oh, thanks. Songbirds <laughs> 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 is an amazing book, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, his, that was actually inspired by a couple of uh, animes that were about musicians or mangas. Uh, one was Gravitation, and the other was Bronze. And, and I liked writing poetry, so I kind of had the lyrics. That's where I got that idea from. So I was like, I have a way to use my poetry in a book. That's kind of how that started. I had the lyrics going for it. Um, it depends. If I'm writing, I like to look to like music. No words are in Japanese, so I don't understand what they're saying. It doesn't distract me. Mm-hmm. So, yes, or, or I'm kind of getting to K pop too, dark world. But also, uh, though I'm drawing, though, I like to listen to kind of dance, upbeat music, or a lot of 80s music. So it can depend on the mood I'm going for. Mm-hmm. I'll, um, I'll create a playlist <laughs> for whatever project <laughs> I'm working on. But also, when I draw, sometimes I'll, I'll kind of experience a little bit of synesthesia. Hmm. So that's kind of why I'll, I'll do it. I'll create music, and then I'll start to see the scene, or, or vice versa. I'll go for a walk, and I'll have my playlist with me, and I'll have my script in hand, or whatever it is that I'm working on. And um, that will bring the images to me, because it'll almost soundtrack the visuals, and it, I'll kind of rotate the camera in my head uh, according to the, the cadences and the different um, the chords and so on. And I'm also a musician, um, so sound tracking things or, or playing things or singing things off the cuff it is something that I've done for a really long time. And, and that's actually what I have formal training in. Um, I, I don't ha- actually have any training as a, an illustrator. Um, I just applied my my knowledge of learning how to learn <laughs> to art. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I'm working on a project with my band, Waking Astronomer, uh, and we plan on putting out visuals to accompany each of the songs and sort of tell a little story uh, a- as we move through each track. So I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Wow, you you guys got you know like I'm I'm truly impressed and uh, I'm like soaking in all of this because I'm like I, I'm thinking my little thing that I'm doing and you guys are like just off the charts here so it you are all very inspirations um, out there and I'm yeah I'm just soaking all of this in and I'm like wow okay another thing to add to my list of discovery I was just telling uh, Jamie another thing I need to look up so this is this is good I'm I'm getting like a nice little history lesson at the same time here. <laughs> Yay. Somebody on Twitter asked, um, will Afua Richardson speak about the stage show she did with Melvin Van Peebles? Ah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> they put you on the spot. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that there was such a really big gap between the first and second issue of Genius is because when they finally hit me with the script about a year later, I was in the middle of a Broadway show. It's kind of a off-Broadway. It was still Broadway. Whatever. A three-man show with uh, Melvin Van Peebles. Nice. And, um, I had to play six, six, six different characters. Ooh. Where, uh, Melvin was narrating, and he was describing this character, and she would sing one bit, and then uh, go at, I say she, was me. So I would have to be these five different characters as he was describing them, run off the stage, run back downstairs, change, and have just enough time to come back up and uh, sing whatever it was he would have me sing. It was different pieces of his past shows, and uh, there was a guitarist named William Spaceman Patterson, Patterson who was uh, performing, but... Uh, Eventually, I, I, you know, I, I left the show regrettably um, after several months, and then we came to Atlanta, Georgia, which I don't regret. But it was a very amazing experience because he was one of those people who is a true polymath. He 
was a World War II pilot. He's old. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> He's old. His cargo was the atom bomb, and he, he remembers, like, oh. having it in, like, having it behind him and him saying to himself, Melvin, you've got to get your black ass out of the military. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so he decides he wants to make movies, and he's never done a film before. He he was stationed in France, didn't speak French, and so he said, well, I'm going to just do it. So the first time he's um, been behind a camera was on the set of his first film, and he made several films in France um, and just became this... Uh, sort of celebrated icon there and they didn't know he was black in the states when they funded his first films here mm. so uh, he he was also a stockbroker he was the first black stockbroker I mean it was he he handed me like one rehearsal he handed me his graphic novel he was like oh yeah I decided I wanted to uh, draw a graphic novel and then I started looking through some of his old um, scores and things like that and the band that he had on his first American film I think was um, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. I mean he's extraordinary. He uses his like Grammys as paperweights. <laughs> <laughs> he jogs like 15 miles a day. <laughs> like he's just extraordinary. He's in his 80s and he is sharp as a tack and I just I was just so honored to work with someone like that. And I thought to myself, man, I just hope I can get up without a cane. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's an awesome story. I saw him in a theater once. That was pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> this was at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York. He was. Um, he had a film. God, I, I wish I remember the name of the film, but he was presenting a film there, and he was in the audience. And I was like, Oh my God! There's Melvin Van Peebles. That's so awesome. <laughs> 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 who Who might some uh, like? I guess uh, the this a celebrity that you all would like want to meet. Like, what's what's one celebrity that you'd like to meet right now? And or and would possibly starstruck be starstruck if you saw them like just going into the Walgreens, you know, tomorrow. Mm. Um, I mean, I've I used to work in the film industry and I've met a lot of celebrities, so I'd never get starstruck. But I do say that if I were to meet one celebrity, I would probably get starstruck over Prince. Okay. Yeah. Prince is that celebrity <laughs> where you just melt and you go crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I would probably be starstruck over Prince, and that would be the only person. Okay. I actually didn't meet her. I was just in the audience, but I was starstruck over Janelle Monae because I loved the concert of her. I was like, oh. I was like, that was amazing. <laughs> and now I didn't actually meet her, but I was still starstruck. <laughs> it's kind of like you did, yeah. <laughs> I was like within 30 feet of her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that counts. We're going to still make that count. <laughs> I would love to meet Ronda Rousey. Ah. Ah. That, might be, that might be something that's doable, like easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to draw her as a superhero. Like that's that's just probably going to have to happen. She, I love her determination. I love her spirit. And she can break somebody's arm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. Nobody is disrespecting her. At all. She gives new meaning to, you know, fighting like a girl, you know. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I climbed a mountain today. Like, yeah. No, like, li literally, I climbed a mountain today. We went to hike Stone Mountain today. And I was just oh, like. Oh, yeah, Stone Mountain. <laughs> I was like, I need to get back in shape. <laughs> Thanks, See, I think for me, it would probably be Denzel Washington. Like, I've just followed him since all the way, way back in his, you know, uh, Mighty Quinn days and way back in theater days. I think that would be the person. And I was almost close because his son was at Morehouse when I was at Clark Atlanta. And mm. it was, I was, like, so close. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to gaze from the distance. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that would be my celebrity person. Nice. But yes, uh, 
Um, I did want to, because uh, we've had such a, a great discussion, I did want to uh, pull out a couple of hot topics um, to kind of like pose to you all and get your thoughts on them. Um, one in particular was on uh, the ugly tweets that was mentioned about Monet Davis, and mm. she's not the first who this has happened to. Um, it happened to Kwanzaa, um, um also, and then um, the uh, young lady that was in uh, the uh, Hunger Games. And so um, I just want to kind of get you all's thoughts on children being kind of like exposed to this ugliness and how and where, where does the line, you know, where do we cross the line or where do we kind of like address this? Like, okay, kids shouldn't be a part of this. Yeah, they should leave kids alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, yeah. though, how, you know, with some of the comments about young black women, whether they're in sports or they're actresses or what have you, how they're, even girls are sort of treated or sexualized as women or um, or, yeah. or talked about in inappropriate adult ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, uh, in some ways, being a trend and being seen as acceptable, um, I think is, well, I mean, it's obviously problematic, but um, it's it's um, interesting, too, and in a bad way. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely, I think, um, a, a trend, right? So I'm also thinking about the way in which um, the young... Um, black girl who played the lead in Annie um, yeah. was talked about in the first film that she was in, and some of the comments made about her. Mm. And um, yeah, and then, I don't know. I mean, how we would connect that back to to, to to comic books or representations of young girls or black women in comics or women in general? But um, there's probably some parallels. Definitely. <laughs> hmm. It's interesting um, in regards to Monet Davis. The comment that was made about her was kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a 13-year-old yeah. girl, and for someone in college to call her a slut, even in passing, right? You know, it's it's like you kind of have to be uh, completely unconscious, a little bit of a sociopath, maybe, or uh. just <laughs> you know, because one out of every 22 people are devoid of conscience. And that's a lot right. of people, you know. Right. So for if you think of a little, I mean, she's thirteen. Think of a little girl like that. That's yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly, exactly. But also, look at what Monet Davis did. She right. called the school and she said, you know, people make mistakes. I know this person was, you know, removed from their team because of what they said, but I don't take it personally. So, would you please reconsider putting them back? Uh, do you, do you even like? Do we like stop for a second and understand the gravity of that? Somebody who was older than them publicly disrespected them on Twitter, and they said, "Go, cool. not that it's acceptable, but that no sweat off my back." Right. You know, like and was concerned about their well-being. That just shows the level of maturity. And the the exceptional mentality of that young lady, and she deserves super kudos for that. Yeah, it was good to see that she took the high road and asked that he be reinstated. But at the same time, I can't help but feel he should have taken some kind of accountability for what he said. Absolutely, absolutely. You have to deal with that so shame. Yeah, I mean, words hold so much power. Even if you're yeah. using social media, um, yeah. you really need to be careful and be cognizant of what you say. So um, I do respect the fact that she said that, but I, I wish that he had just been accountable for his actions and stayed, you know, being suspended. Yeah, you know, and I don't know what the outcome of that was, if he was actually reinstated, but then you have to think about the the gra gravity of that as well because he now has to deal with that. He has right. to be known as right. the person who called a 13-year-old girl. A 13-year-old girl who is one of the only female little league players who throws a 70 mile per hour fastball. Right. right. A slut. Right. Yep. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and that will, that will come back to haunt him. Like, it, yeah. it, it will always come back. No one who's going to touch him. Like no one's going to, you know, uh, want to work with someone like that. 
And how stupid to archive something like that on social media when you know that people screenshot things mm -hmm. within an yeah. instant, even if you delete it. Because I saw his tweets, mm -hmm. and he was all apologetic and deleted the tweets. Like, sorry, oh, dude. Apologetic. <laughs> sorry, dude. It, it, it's already been screenshotted. It, yeah. It's already been put out there. It's already written in an article somewhere, embedded in several tweets. He got caught. Yeah. But it's also interesting. I mean, maybe one of the the parallels to to comics, and I know I don't know if we want to get into the whole gaming issue and Gamergate and all of that. Mm. But the internet has opened up, and I'm sure Jamie and Grace, you have ideas about this too. It, it's opened up spaces for women, for people of color in general, um, to find community. But on the other hand, it's become this space where people can get on Twitter, right? Um, and say these things, um, and there's lots of conversation lately about how women are particularly um, vulnerable. I mean, I, I don't know, Nara and Afu, if you have any ideas about this too. I, I'm just interested as um, creators, artists, writers, if um, there's, uh, you know, what your experience is like with um, the internet and maybe harassment or not, and then, um, you know, um, also, um, just the whole issue of um, women being able to create blogs. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like Grace has some ideas about this too, and um, you know, um, blogging as something um, and and creating internet forums. I mean, things like Black Comics Chat as this you know great opportunity um, for marginalized communities, but also you know there's all of this hate on the internet too. So like both of those things kind of working at the same time. I don't know. That's something that anyone wants to sort of talk about. I don't sure. actually openly interact with people on the internet that much. Most of the people who I talk to on the internet, I know through someone or have met somewhere. Which now hates people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Even on the internet, apparently, it carried on. I get pings, but. If I don't know you at all, I probably won't connect to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who are you? Are you trying to <laughs> or whatever? I'm like I don't know you, so I just ignore them. So I might be lucky that way, where I just aren't connected to a lot of people online, so I don't have to to deal with it. And the few people who have kind of guess been rude or trolled, I just block them because there's too much work to respond. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. People generate something that I, I like to call e-courage. Mm. They uh, say things that they wouldn't say in person. Right, right. And because there are really no face-to-face -face consequences for the things they have to say, they can hide behind the wall of their computer and say whatever it is that they're going to do or say whatever it is they're going to say without you know, actually saying this to someone's face. Like, could someone who is in college go up to a 13-year-old and say, yeah, you slut, you blah, blah, blah. Maybe they could. Maybe they could. <laughs> but more than likely, they wouldn't if it weren't for the, the platform of social media. And I've been, uh, I've, you know, I've been attacked about various things, and I'll be very confrontational about different subjects, and people will disagree with me, but being able to defend your point and not attack the person is something that I really try to strive for because mm. they'll utilize a logical fallacy called ad hominem or against the man where they'll attack me personally instead of my points. And right. I'll try to point that out to them. Like when they start using like um, different tactics, uh, uh, appeal to ridicule, uh, uh, an appeal to authority. Like, oh, well, or, you know, well, what do you know? You're just a comic book artist. Um, I was like, well, you're not attacking my point. Right, right, right. <laughs> like that, so what, I'm a comic book artist. That doesn't mean that I'm incapable of coming up with a, a rational argument, and it seems that you are out of arguments because now you're attacking me. Yep. <laughs> so, for instance, uh, I was attacked very harshly about the cover for issue one of Genius. Mm -hmm. And I tried to explain through the internets uh, the symbolism, but it was just uh, in some cases a ploy to promote other people's books or for them to say, oh, you just have a minor who's barely clothed and over-sexualized uh, on a cover. And where I understood the sentiments, uh, I tried to explain to them, look, she is a symbol. 
she is wrapped in caution tape, number one, to say, do not cross her lines. Do not cross her lines. <laughs> you are entering a danger zone if you cross her, number one. Uh, two, she's wearing yellow to um, uh, represent Prometheus because she's bringing strategy to the streets to take it out of, like, you know, petty warfare and into organized uh, attack on both media and a physical front, uh, whereas Prometheus brought technology from the gods to the people, which was fire, and she's bringing fire arms. Um, and a bunch of other symbols that I tried to bring forward, but people wanted to just feel whatever it was they were going to feel without really bringing forward a logical argument, and they just wanted to say that I was cashing out. They don't really know how much or how little money I make or made. <laughs> this is a work for hire and not uh, a creator-owned series, even though I created the look at the characters. Um, they have these misconceptions that because the book is doing well that I'm just rolling in dough and that's not happening. <laughs> You know, so and when it comes to the internet, you have to kind of like take a step back and just say, okay, let's start addressing the points instead of, and bring forward when they're veering from the topic. And, you know, when I organized my thoughts and just published a blog article and says, hey, look, I have everything that I need to say there. Um, it helped a great deal. It helped me organize my thoughts instead of the petty quarreling and, and warbling and hooting and hollering that happens sometimes on the internet because people are not making things and they just want to argue with me. I'm like, I have stuff to draw. I ain't got time to argue with y'all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I think, um, you know, like blogging and, um, all, you know, just having a presence on social media and Twitter and so forth, I think it can be very useful, and, and unfortunately, there are some folks who, like, go to the left. And, you know, sometimes it's, I think that's to be expected, and, um, I mean, we shouldn't have to deal with it, but it's, it's one of those things that we, we do have to battle with. But, um, I mean, I'm grateful that I have the platform to do that because I, I have some e-courage in, in the sense that, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person that I can, I can do a lot of writing and I can write, uh, get the, my words out that way versus being in, you know, another platform. So I think, um, I love, you know, the term e-courage. I think, it, you know, it has a, a pro and a con way to look at it. Um, and so for me, you know, that e-courage works for me in being able to, you know, write my blog and or, or the thoughts that I have on another blog or contribute and um, kind of make, put my message out there in that way. And hopefully, you know, stir some, stir some conversation because I don't want everybody to agree with me either. And, you know, right. so you, you would hope that it does stir enough to, you know, have healthy debates. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that, like, okay, I don't, you know, there's no intention of, like, being hurtful and all of that either. So. Right. All right. I like how you said that, how, it, you know, e-courage can be used, um, you know, as Afua said, it could be used for evil or it could be used for good because I'm, I'm with you, Grace. I articulate myself better through writing than speaking. And sometimes I find that when I'm on social media, I can have a conversation or be very vocal about, you know, some sort of injustice that's happening. And it's easier for me to say that um, either on Twitter or in the form of a blog than it is for me to speak out about it. Um, so I think that that's very interesting. And as far as, you know, the harassment and the way people treat folks on social media, my biggest thing is don't engage. It's yeah. really the easiest and the quickest way to avoid that kind of harassment. Um, I block someone the minute I find that they are being abusive. Yep. And I, I get criticized every single day on Twitter. And, I mean, it's not something that's, like, really harsh or vicious. But people will, you know, say things, and I'll I'll get mansplained. I get mansplained all the time. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get geek checked all the time, um, and it's to be expected. You know, I'm I'm a woman. I'm a black woman. People will say that to me, um, but you know, I I don't take it. I don't let it. You know, simmer. I don't let it. I don't relish on it, and I really don't let it bug me. 
and I will just block that person and move on to the next thing and usually it's just not that big of a deal at that point and folks are really supportive I've noticed like when I have gotten into Twitter debates with folks because you know I have a large follower count people see the tweets and they interject and and they you know say hey this is not cool what you're saying right now mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's cool to see to get that kind of support because not everybody's able to get that kind of support when they engage with folks on Twitter but um, you know, you're going to deal with that. That sort of goes with the territory of being online and being an, a presence online um, and having a public identity online. Um, but the best way to avoid it is just don't engage. Absolutely. Yeah. Than I am. <laughs> <laughs> False hate to be ignored. Yes, exactly. That's this what they true. want is attention. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's like, what do I feed you? Attention. <laughs> I'm fresh out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, ladies, we have been uh, going quite a while, and I, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm, re I really think there's going to have to be a part two. Um, I've got, I had a lot of people come to express wanting, you know, interest in taking part, and um, I mean, this is, this has been great, and we have so many topics that we've covered, and. Even some we didn't get a chance to touch upon, but I think nonetheless this has been uh, awesome and a, a great way to um, end out Women's History Month. You know, like I said, what better way than to have a, a panel full of women and, and discussing the topics that we want to talk about and want to put out there into the universe. So um, I just wanted to kind of ask each of the ladies if they could kind of give, you know, any words that they want to as far as like encouragement, motivation, any things for them to look out for. Also make sure to shout yourself out as far as your um, your social media outlets and all that and you know definitely so that other people can be able to follow you and talk with you and chat with you and all that good stuff. Who's starting? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever goes first. <laughs> um. Well I, I guess I'll go first. Um, this is Jamie again from Black Girl Nerds. Um, Thank you guys for tuning in. I, I see a lot of folks on Twitter um, are using the hashtag and engaging with us tonight. So thank you guys for listening in and supporting Black Comics Chat, especially this particular episode of Black Comic Chat um, with black women talking about comics. I think that's awesome. I hope to see more of this. Um, but blackgirlnerds.com is the website. It's an online community, so you can engage with the community in several different ways. Twitter is my playground, um, as Grace mentioned before in the bio, so there's live tweets that happen practically every night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in addition to that, there's a podcast. So every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can listen in via TWIB. The web address is listen.twib.fm. And uh, we will have Santana Dempsey from HBO's The Newsroom to talk to us tomorrow night about, um, or not tomorrow night, Sunday night, um, about diversity and women of color in Hollywood. So she'll join us. We had a chat that was supposed to happen last Sunday where we were going to have the guys from Milestone um, come on the show. And I am still working on that. Folks that are tweeting to me about it, um, please be patient. I am trying to get that rescheduled. So um, I will make sure that that happens. But you can tune in April. It's going to be April the 12th. Uh, Joseph Illich, uh, former DC Comics editor and also contributor to the Color Barrier on Comic Book Resources, he'll be coming on the podcast. Um, so tune in to that because uh, he can definitely. He also used to work with Milestone, um, so he'll he'll definitely be able to discuss a lot of the questions that we um, had planned for the Milestone guys. But I will make sure that we can try to get those guys back ASAP. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks for inviting me, by the way. Yes, thank you for uh, taking a part. Much appreciated. Oh, thanks for inviting me, too. I feel like I need to go and make more books now. Uh, <laughs> right, just, me, too. <laughs> uh, I think I need to do more. Uh, yeah, but I'm going to do another magical girl book. Uh, also another uh, book of visual poetry sometime this year. Uh, the best place to keep track of me is on Instagram, where I post my sketches, uh, Occasionally, when I'm eating at Starbucks and random things <laughs> on Instagram, it is prettyism, which is just P R E T T Y I S M. Uh, that name came about because my art teachers constantly complain that my art was <laughs> pretty. 
so I just decided to make it prettier, and you know, I didn't do so hot in art school. But that's okay. That's not... Yeah, I I just wanted to um, thank everyone too. I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. Uh, thank you to 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 Grace and Afua, um, and Nara and and Jamie. It's just been an amazing experience. Um, I'm all over the internet. Um, I don't necessarily think my website's that interesting, but it's DebraElizabethWhaley.com. I do have a blog. I have a Tumblr. Um, I have uh, all of that, but I guess uh, the main thing is I do have this book coming out called Black Women in Sequence, Reinking Comics, Graphic Novels, and Anime that comes out um, in the early fall, and um, I'm just looking forward to that and um, hoping people will uh, seek it out. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for letting me ramble on. And chat with you. It, it's been amazing, like listening to your stories, and, and just it's such an honor to be with such amazing creators, like all in one space. And, and it really makes me encouraged to just know these conversations are happening, understanding that the change is is rapidly moving, and that people are receiving it well. And um, my internet homes. Um, my website is afua, A-F-U-A, richardson.info. Uh, I'm also on Tumblr at Instagram, uh, backslash docta, D-O-C-T-A, F-O-O. Uh, I'm also at Tumblr at the same handle, D-O-C-T-A, F-O-O. Uh, I have a Facebook group where I share all of my techniques and whatnot because if it weren't for my friends, I would not be the artist <laughs> that I am. Um, so I try to pay that forward. Uh, on Facebook, my group is Dr. Foo's Lab. And um, let's see. Uh, my band page is wakingastronomer.com. Cool. And um, you all can check me out in next month on Black Comics Chat. But uh, just, uh, just for those who are tuning in, I am one of the, the newest additions to the Black Comics Chat. Um, you can catch me on Twitter at gbreezy20. Um, you can also check me out with Jamie on Black Girl Nerds. And you can check me out on my uh, blog, Black Savant Cinema, where I talk about film, movies, popular culture, all that great stuff. And if you're an academic and you want to check out my academic work, you can check me at uh, UC Berkeley and academia.edu. Um, Grace skips in there. So... Um, it's been awesome, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you for shedding your light and your wisdom and your talents uh, via this uh, this podcast. Um, thank you for your patience and thank you for working with me as well. I look forward to each and every one of you coming back to Black Comics Chat because this will not be the last. So we've already gotten people from tweets saying that we, you know, that they want you all to return on some occasion or another. So. Uh, stay tuned for another invite in the new, near future. And we hope everyone out there enjoyed today's um, session on Black Comics Chat. And uh, the regular hosts will be back on um, in, uh, next month. And stay tuned for that. And um, any other shout-outs anybody want to put out there before we roll out? Oh, I, I have one quick one. I'll um, be in uh, Cambridge April 9th talking about graphic novels and hip-hop at the Hip Hop Archive at uh, Harvard. So, um, with John wow. Jennings and uh, mm. Nicole Hodges personally. So. Yay. Wow, nice. Yay. Um, well, just quick shout out on Twitter. There's going to be another Twitter slash podcast event. If you are a fan of the Game of Thrones series, um, at Hugh Golden on Twitter, Ebony, she's going to be hosting Blurred's Landing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to do book one um, and, and just go push forward. So if you want to join us, uh, stay tuned for that. She'll be making announcements, and I'll be retweeting them, and it should be a lot of fun. Cool. Awesome. Yay. All right, good people. Will you enjoy your weekend? Uh, continue. There's still a few days left of Women's History Month, so uh, you know if that means going to pick up a book, picking up a, a comic, uh, sending a post in, tweeting your favorite uh, sheroes, whatever the case may be. 
Um, you can do that in March and pretty much any other day of the month. But uh, so that for left for me for Women's History Month. So once again, we thank everyone for joining us and stay tuned for Black Comics Chat on next month. Have a great one. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye.